Good morning and welcome to Involk, the, uh, what is it, Celtic day, first day of spring. So welcome to spring. Oh, I think you can all hear me okay. Put your thumbs up if you can. Great. So welcome to the first day of Celtic spring. It's the first day of the lambing season. So it's really good that you're up bright eyed and bushy tailed or at least just up. So let's start the class by standing up. If you've got a brick, one of these kind of bricks, super duper, we're gonna use that first. You can use a regular brick such as this, and you can use, of course, a book, which will be comparable uh, in size. So welcome everyone. Feet apart, coyote saga, the pose. Well, it's a kind of attitude in a way, coyote saga. It means casting off the body, but as some of you know from previous classes, I like to reframe that <coughs> as casting off the idea of a body as a separate, autonomous, discrete uh, particle, because what the body really is, is something inter interdependent. So hold your brick in front of you or block or um, book and simply raise it up. You can balance it between your thumb, index finger and middle finger, which make a kind of L and a backwards L and lightly tone your tummy, breathing through your nose. Find the pelvic floor. So as you move investigatively, naturally, kindly in a way that's breath centered as you move this way and that way you can tune in tune in <clears throat> so <clears throat> just as it's relatively early it's still dark in the uk anyway at this time of year which is first of february uh, in bulk as i mentioned which which is a word that means in the belly celtic word that means in the belly <clears throat> in a sense, the day is in the belly at this point before it's light. It's ready to be birthed soon. Huh? It's there, it's real, huh? like the bulbs in the ground. So we sense this inner uh, stirring, this prana shakti. And we don't need to show a lot externally. Hmm? That will come by itself. And that's the right attitude for yoga generally. Make sure your neck isn't tight. Light tone back, back in the tummy if you forgot. Find the pelvic floor. Breathe in a way that has the confidence of knowing that it's all in the belly, as it were. <coughs> that is to say, everything's natural, naturally coming. What you've just got to do, what we've got to do, is sort of ride that wave to sort of tune in on that. Okay, it's probably raised the block up for enough and you can bring it back down. Step your feet generously apart. Check in that the toes are not turning out. They can even turn in. And do what you can to repeatedly extend the little toe side of the foot and place and replace the feet so that you balance the inner and outer ankles. Huh? Breath should come and go naturally. So again, we're pointing to this sense of trust <coughs> that it's, it, it's there already, you know, it's like a wave, Sanskrit word, Udami, that we're, we're learning to ride by tuning in. So everything that comes, all the sort of expression, what we might call Shakti, comes out of something much more, well, in, in essentially empty. Hmm? Sort of everything is born out of nothing. So you have to get in touch with nothing, which is in the belly, which is the unseen. And in the Sanskrit tradition, the unseen is drishti, or drishta, sorry, I should say, uh, the seer. The unseen is that which does the seeing. Raise your block up again. Lightly tone the tummy. So what I'm trying to point us all towards this morning is this sense of intimacy this lovely sense of getting involved in the currents that are deep in the body, riding those, and they will eventually express, as it were, superficially, in other words, in a way that can be seen. 
So if we look at the tantric tradition, a, a tradition that bases itself on the seen and unseen principles being one, we have that as Shiva, the unseen, and Shakti as the seen. Inhale, lift from the groins, exhale, fold. Now you can have your block any way that suits you. We want to have this homage, you could say, to the flowing sensations deep down. So take deep breaths. Most um, practitioners of yoga have certainly heard of Pratyahara as one of the eight steps of Patanjali yoga. So Pratyahara is made of Prati plus Ahara. Prati means to turn away. And Ahara means food, literally food. But it doesn't mean don't have your breakfast. Do have your breakfast, not now, but when the time's right. <coughs> it, it means turning away from running things exteriorly. Yeah? So this is why we've got this uh, emphasis this morning, because it is in bulk and almost the Chinese New Year as well, while we're at it. It's a very auspicious morning. So it's a very good morning to get up in time for your 7 a.m. yoga hour. Huh? So tuning in on the subtle current means here and now you might be moving left and right. That's movement is both tuning in and responding. Right? It's listening and responding. It's listening because you stimulate sensations. It's responding because then those sensations talk to you and tell you to move, right? So movement is both listening and responding. Just like a painter might put a stroke on, her, on the canvas and then she might step back and take another stroke on the canvas and another and so on. Okay, we're gonna stay in this, which is called Prasvita Padottanasana Ekam, number one, balancing and rebalancing. When we practice honesty, satya, um, we can really feel there's an infinite potential to get into this moment. Uh, each moment is a sort of gateway, you could say, isn't it? To the infinite. Back to fingertips and come up <coughs> all the way. Well done, hands to your hips. Walk your feet together. So the infinite is Shakti, is a Prakriti. Hmm? Walk your feet together. <laughs> Tadasana. So together, if possible. Sometimes it's not possible. Perhaps the thighs come together before the feet. Wouldn't be wise to then push the feet uh, together. They can be apart, but if they are apart, <coughs> also if you're pregnant, by the way, and also just if the feet, uh, perhaps there are bunions, or they just don't feel comfortable together, then apart, but they should be level, right? So make sure one isn't forwards, one back, one in, one out. <sighs> So we're talking today about undoing, we're talking about the subtle manifesting uh, what we might call the gross, you know, the sukshma, subtle, leading to the stula, the gross. So here in this pose, adjusting your feet is where it starts. I find, maybe you will as well, lifting and landing the insides of my feet multiple times has multiple benefits. Number one benefit is uh, as I lift, the instep of one foot, my body drifts and I can feel all the muscles move and I can use that as a listening responding as previously described. Right. Number two is as you lift and land your feet, you're massaging the plantar fascia on the soles of the feet. And that massage is right the way up through the back chain. So through the legs, through the buttocks, through the back itself, even through the neck and through to the frontalis muscles on the forehead. <sighs> Number three is it allows tuning in. What we're tuning into is not something you can grasp with your thinking mind, because that's the gross, nothing wrong with the gross. It's just that we have, we're understanding the source, the source of it, the, the yoni. Yoni means lots of things, but it, one of the meanings is source, the origin. It can mean womb as well. So again, we're back to, this theme of in the belly. Hmm? Raise the arms without impinging on the roots of the neck. Now that doesn't mean raise the arms and drop the shoulder blades uh, or drop the shoulders as one sometimes uh, hears. Some yoga teachers will say that. And, you know, they're on to, onto something. <laughs> they're not wrong, they're onto something. But it could be said perhaps with more refinement because 
it's actually impossible to raise your arms and drop your shoulders. You end up with two contrary instructions that just make a bit more tension. The instruction is raise your arms, but don't tense the trapezius. So a broad overview of that muscle is you know, from the base of the skull down to the lateral third of the collarbones and then back down and in to the bottom of the ribs, a trapezoid shape on your back. Huh? So feel that that's relaxed. And that relaxation comes from this, this awareness of the subtle substratum, the, the subtle movements of prana shakti. Yeah? Big circle. Well done, everyone. Hands to heart. Catch your breath. Catch two, three, four or more breaths. Avoid stasis. Yeah? That doesn't mean you can't be externally still. <clears throat> it means that you should be aware of movement and that can be very, very subtle movement, flow, mental flow, physical flow, respiratory flow. And as I say, I want to reiterate, that doesn't mean you have to keep moving externally physically, although you can if you want. I, I often find that that is useful. Raise the arms again. Again, have the attitude of softness, which you feel body, brain and breath. Anyone who knows anything about their bodies know. <laughs> absolutely <laughs> that their minds affect their bodies in fact everyone knows it when they're stressed they know their body feels it when they're excited they know their body feels it huh? so anyone who is a body worker would be missing a massive trick if they weren't incorporating their mental attitude to make physical benefits huh? So one of the best attitudes is the attitude of gratitude because it makes you give to this moment in a way that's relaxed and trusting. Like we're being encouraged to give to the fact that spring is coming. Maybe it's not physically manifesting ma massively. There are bulbs beginning to show, but maybe not flowers yet. Huh? And we bring that into our yoga as trust. Now press your feet, raise your fingers on the inhale, inhale. Exhale, bend your ankles, knees and hips. Maybe there's cracking, but you're muted, so I can't hear it. <laughs> then you can move up and down if you feel it's useful. You can bend your arms or extend your arms. These are all options. You can turn the heels of the hands out. The point is to serve this flow that you can hear, as it were. And actually, the truth is others can feel it too. People know when somebody else is in a state of relaxed flow, they're sort of riding the wave of the moment. And they, they say things like, oh, that's a nice person. <laughs> such and such is so relaxed. What nice energy they have. <laughs> Nobody has a nice energy or not a nice energy. Energy, when it flows, feels good to self and other. Stand up when you're ready. Big wide circle. Hands to heart. Everyone takes a deep breath. Let's hear. Well, I can't hear actually, but I can feel it because prana shakti doesn't, isn't separate, huh? just like electrons in the universe and don't exist here more than there. An electron can disappear from one part of the universe and reappear instantly in another. In another. That's because electrons are part of a field and particles are just potentials, potential places uh, that that field could become excited. Hmm? Now we're going to step or jump. I don't know how you're feeling, but it's up to you. I'm going for a jump. I'm quite a, I suppose I'm quite a springy kind of personality, perhaps sometimes a little too springy. Lightly tone the tum. And when you raise your arms, of course, you can feel your collarbones go up too, right? So just drop them a little bit and then raise them. You'll feel your collarbones go up. You'll feel your side abdomen go up. And that means if you lightly tone your tummy, then you're going to feel a little buoyancy on the pelvic floor. What practitioners of yoga, of course, usually call muladhara, uh, the pelvic floor area, or the, the light buoyancy is called um, mulabandha. Left toes in, right foot and leg out on the ball of the foot first, and then finish off the turn on the heel. Open the chest, make sure the neck's relaxed, the trapezius is peaceful, which has to be psychophysical for it to be anything. Raise your lead arm, inhale, exhale, come down. Keep the back of your leg feeling like it moves into towards the front of the leg. Catch your breath. You can have your top arm up. You can have it on your hip. You can have it round and holding your uh, thigh, which is something <coughs> that I think is nice to do occasionally if your arm's long enough. It's really about that more than anything else. 
But what is universally the same for us all is that we breathe into this. Huh? So jaw soft, eyes soft, breathing into this. Joyful trikona asana. Three angles, trikona. Okay, come up <clears throat> nice and easy. Find the pelvic floor. Turn the feet forwards, hands on your hips for a moment. That keeps the collarbones broad. Breathe through your nose and deep breaths. And while we're breathing, we can scan, scan the body for flow. Vahi, V-A-H-I, Vahi. And flow is a universal principle. That is to say, if it's anywhere, it's everywhere. It's not something you construct, it's something you trust. <laughs> it's something you give to. There's a Zen saying, and it says, in the spring, the grass grows by itself. Back toes in, front foot and leg out on the ball of the foot, finish off the turn on the heel. Now, before actually, before you raise your arms, just prepare, as it were, <laughs> or tune in, or get ready to tune in, on the way the body is lifted as the collarbones lift because it lifts the breastbone, lifts the ribs, lifts all the soft tissue. So now raise your arms, feel the lift, right, right down to the pelvic floor, which is sukshma, subtle. And it's exactly that subtleness that we're tuning in on. In fact, we're tuning on, on the subtlest. Truthfully, yoga, if we're gonna really be honest about what yoga is, it's emptiness dancing. So you have to listen to emptiness as it were, which is in some traditions called Shiva, as in the, the blue dreadlocked God. But he actually, in some traditions, it's not a blue dreadlocked God, but the emptiness principle, the consciousness principle. Inhale, exhale, come down. Mm -hmm. So some Buddhist schools, uh, uh, Vijnana Vada, uh, the consciousness only, is also known as the Yogacara, the, the yoga school huh, of Buddhism, founded by a Sangha around the uh, 400 common era, same sort of time as Patanjali wrote the sutras. So as you're in Trikonasana with your arm up or on your hip or round, emptiness dancing means you give yourself, right? Give yourself to emptiness. Now, emptiness doesn't mean nothingness. Nobody can't comprehend nothingness. It's, it's impossible. Right? Yeah, emptiness means that you're not clinging to anything in particular so that you're available. You're light. Like a dandelion seed is light. So lightness is open-mindedness, lightness is non-attachment, lightness is availability, lightness is how you practice yoga, lightness is an open hand, lightness is a happy heart. Okay, good job, well done, come on up, well done. <laughs> feet face forwards, hands on the hips, take some deep breaths, walk your feet towards each other. Take your time, walk your feet towards each other. Uttita hasta padangushtasana. So bring the feet together or close. Have a look down at your feet. Make sure that if they're not together, that they are close and that they are level. Hmm? They want to be as close as possible for a pose like Uttita hasta padangushtasana because <laughs> if you take them too far apart, the balance just gets thrown out quite easily. So raise up your left heel. Breathe through your nose still. Move the standing leg foot by moving the leg and the pelvis and the torso backwards and forwards. And the purpose of your movement is to wake up to the aliveness, the sort of subtle flows, the current you could call it, that drives, if you imagine a river has a current that drives the water and the leaves that go on it and the fish that are in it and the plants everything. You're tuning in on the currents, which uh, tuning in has nothing to do with thinking. 
it's just like having a kiss or it's like dancing or it's like eating something really lovely or it's like opening up to swimming in cold water, which I know uh, many of you like. <laughs> and I say many of you, because I'm not that keen, although I have taken to a 30 second cold shower before I turn it warm in the mornings. <laughs> it's my, my effort in that regard. Anyway, tuning into your three foot arches, inner, outer, transverse. And when you feel this some awakeness, then you go ahead and raise up the other leg. Reach down for the big toe with your index finger, middle finger and thumb, and your hand goes on your hip. Longer arms are helpful here, but there's nothing you can do about that. The arms are the length that they are. Breathe through the nose, raise up the inner groin. Now you can keep the leg bent or uh, straighten it if you want. Keeping it bent, it works really well. Uh, most of this pose is actually about the standing leg. So it doesn't overly matter whether it's bent or straight, but it does matter that you breathe into it and you wake up to it. Huh? Good job, everyone. Bring the leg back down. Catch your breath. I know you need a deep breath to take one properly deep. And loosen up <coughs> any way that feels, you know, loose. So you could sort of shimmy shake. But do take those deep breaths and, you know, do whatever feels appropriate morning-wise. I can hear the birds are singing where I am. Maybe they're beginning to sing where you are too. Raise up <coughs> the other heel. Breathe through your nose. Purposefully waking up. So we call it Lila Arta Lakshana in, in Vajrasati Yoga play, lila, that's the movements. Arta, the purpose of the movements, which is absorption huh? into this field, which we can call the goddess, we can call prakriti, which means nature. And the field huh, is interdependent. So the field liberates you. That's why we encourage ourselves to trust, to let go, to relax, to enjoy. <laughs> In fact, the texts literally tell us that the experience and enjoyment of nature serves two purposes. Well, nature has two purposes, experience and enjoyment for the purusha and the liberation of the purusha, that is the, uh, the seer, the one who sees. <laughs> okay, when you're ready, go ahead and hold the big toe, index finger, middle finger and thumb. Breathing through the nose. Everything flows to the yogini who's well, full of trust. The, the word in Sanskrit, shraddha. Trust and love are actually synonymous here. You've got the option if you want it uh, to straighten the leg. But it's either way. So texts like the Upanishads tell us that, or some Upanishads tell us that our essence is prana. Huh? You know, that's sort of the ground of the, our being. And that makes a lot of sense. Because when you tune in on uh, prana, you can bring your leg down now, by the way. Wiggle out a bit and breathe deep. <clears throat> when you tune in on prana, that's the subtle flows. That's nature doing her thing. That's what she's doing underneath the ground right now. She's pregnant, you know, nature's pregnant. She's doing stuff, it's happening. And sometimes we feel like we've got, you know, you wouldn't go out into the garden and try and pull the bulbs up. We trust that they're coming. Same in our yoga practices, this sense of trust, letting go, that allows our inner wisdom or the prakriti to come out of us. Prakriti, certainly in the tantric tradition, is seen as having powers. Prakriti is synonymous with Shakti. Shakti itself means power. Now we're going to come into a forward fold, Uttanasana. So you might want to use your brick again. In fact, I'm going to recommend it completely and so much so that I'm going to use mine uh, as well. Because the thing about using props is you can use them as stations, which are very helpful. Now I've turned sideways. <laughs> Just to make it clear, I'm sure you already understand that you hinge from the hip joints, you fold over the top of the front thighs, the inner groins lift up. Anyway, your brick or whatever you're using goes in front of you. Your feet really should be parallel here, using the 
midline of each foot, right? So if you look at your feet and imagine a line running between the gap between the second and third toe and out of the middle of the heels, and you spread your toes. And of course, the boy, <laughs> I've talked in the past about the little toe being like Piglet from Winnie the Pooh. And I'm quite fond of Piglet, actually, because I've got a bit of Piglet about my personality. I think we all have a bit of Piglet and Eeyore and all the owl and all the rest. That's why those books are charming. But your toes respond to your attitude. So if you have the sort of, you know, I trust her uh, attitude, you know, the flows, the ebbs and flows, then the, the little toes will be able to be uh, released. But if there's non-trust, non if instead you feel like I have to do it as a separate discrete autonomous particle, the tension of I causes physical tension in the various tissues, uh, muscular tissues, but also fascial tissues that make it, in fact, more and more difficult to loosen the little toe. Huh? What makes yoga so difficult is that it's so easy. Raise your arms. Lightly tone the thumb. Find the pelvic floor. Look for looseness everywhere. We have a principle of equality in our lives, don't we? We, we, we think everybody and all beings uh, are equal. We don't think anyone's more has more rights than anyone else. We care about everyone equally. Same in the body. So make sure your neck's not tight. You know, that should be free, free. Your upper back. Your lower back is nice and long. The quadratus lumborum in particular. Lower back muscles. So you find the pelvic floor and you lift up. Now inhale, lift up. Exhale, fold over the top of the front thighs. Hinge from the hip joint. Hands to your brick or bricks. Of course, you haven't got bricks, you could use something else. Breathe easy, jaw soft, eyes soft, chest open. So this Uttanasana, it's like an Ada Uttanasana, half Uttanasana. You could be even higher up on your fingertips or knuckles. Because we really, really, really want the anterior spine to be open along its whole length. Mm -hmm. So Kundalini, which is a, a principle of energy, it's actually another name for the goddess. Kundalini is used variously. It's a sort of description of an energetic force. And then the philosophical angle on it varies slightly from text to text, but one meaning of opening up the central channel is so that the kundalini, kunda meaning coiled, the kundalini can rise up and connect sort of in a sort of um, symbolic way. Shakti, shakti uh, at the pelvic floor area and Shiva at the crown of the head. So what does that mean? <laughs> And that means connecting emptiness or consciousness with objects, with physical manifestation. And when those two connect, the realization is that they're not separate, then everything becomes equal to the yogin. And this means the yogin becomes equally available to all of her life experiences, which are what they are. You know, if we're not available to some because we don't like them as much, or we're not available to others because we're clinging to them, then we can't express love or wisdom. Love and wisdom come, of course, from being available. And if we don't want this and we do want that, then we're kind of pushing life away as it, as it comes to us, instead of responding to life as it comes to us. Now, as I've been talking, Hopefully you're, you're tuning in through movement to massaging the hamstrings, which will help the pelvis release, but also to this sense of anterior openness. Some of you will have experienced your lumbers dipping, hmm? concaving, which is good. If they dip and dip 
and dip and dip, then the tissues between the top of the pelvis and the bottom of the ribs get squashed. And then it's necessary to come lower to alleviate those tensions, but to still keep that sense of a nat what we call natural back. It's unlikely, but it's possible, I guess, that it may come to pass in the time we have that one even you know, stops using the, the brick. But if we're honest, and of course that's fundamental to yoga, and it's perhaps the most difficult part of yoga is to be honest, truly honest. Then we'll keep listening to the flow. We'll keep prioritizing space in the central channel. So this connection, as it were, between Shiva and Shakti manifests. If you do come lower, you could hold your biceps or your elbows. Huh? You wouldn't let your head go completely but you would make sure it's not holding excessive tension. Either way, breath comes and goes, the hamstrings are getting a stretch. Now, even if we've wisely kept our hands on the blocks, we're all, uh, all now gonna bring our hands to the floor flat, which means bending the knees, right, for, for, for most. It could be that you've got super short legs and a super long torso and super long arms, in which case you might not bend the knees, but most of us should bend the knees to bring our hands flat and to keep our backs soft. From that position, with the hands flat on the floor, we're gonna bend our knees further until we feel physical contact with the ribs and the thighs. And then we all hang, we all hang. We let the head go, we let the arms go, we let the neck go, it all hangs. And of course that brings the blood pressure up in the head, which is a good thing, believe it or not. But do make sure your back is soft. Of course your thighs have to work for the holiday that the back and neck are having. That's how it is, isn't it, with holidays? Now bend your knees a bit more until you can bring your hands onto your thighs just above your knees and straighten and lock your elbows. This is the correct way to come up from uh, this Uttanasana number one, the feet apart Uttanasana. Um, there's another method, but this is the sort of fundamental. And then you continue your journey up, getting the energy down as it were bring the energy down by shaking the legs so that you don't feel dizzy. Huh? You don't get any dizziness. Taking a few breaths, that energy comes down. Well done, jaw soft. Now speaking of bringing energy down, let's come down into Adhomukha Svanasana, <coughs> the downward facing dog position. So you know that pose, I'm sure. So as soon as you're ready, you can come into it. Downward facing dog. As ever, we want to pad our paws, our hands, into a deeper weave. You now, everything we do in yoga is symbolic. The whole roots of using your body for yoga is using it symbolically. In other words, making a ritual rather than just having a philosophy abstracted, manifesting that philosophy in your body huh, brings it to life. So we find, you know, in the first tantric text that we're instructed to use our body to make the shapes of the Sanskrit alphabet, for example. And the Sanskrit alphabet itself is seen as the sort of womb, the yoni, because of course, out of words come things. Huh? A table becomes a table because we agree what table means, right? Really, it's just wood, you know, and we've decided that's a table and we've decided what the word table means. So out of words come things. So words are yoni, source. So in this pose, as you pad your paws into the mat more deeply, and as you play, you're tuning into that source, which we could call mula prakriti, Prakriti, remember, means nature. 
and mula means root, the root of nature. This is kind of the process of involution, as it's called, going back to the source where the gunas are in balance. So the gunas are rajas, uh, tamas, and sattva. Mm -hmm. uh, activity, inertia, and illumination. Yeah? Okay, well done. Come down to a kneeling position. And of course, many of us will find utility in using blocks between the heels <coughs> and the buttocks. So here, if the knees are tight, that's often really, really useful, really important. One hand on top of the other, breathing through the nose. Jaw soft, eyes soft. Perhaps there's movement. So it's natural, isn't it? Movement on the shins, for example. We'll massage the shin muscles, including the anterior tibialis. It will massage the calf muscles, gastrocnemius, soleus. It will massage the thighs, the buttocks, front and back thighs, you know, the hip flexors, the hip rotators, external, internal rotators. Every, I'm just going to list the whole body because <laughs> when you move side to side, you can feel. <sighs> All the way through. So do that for yourself. Feel through all the different muscle areas you can feel. Some stretched, some contracted huh? at, different po at different times. Expressive breath. And what does the breath express? Trust huh? in the spring. The grass grows by itself. This allows us to be empty. It's kind of the opposite advice that Baden Powell used to give out. <laughs> Baden Powell, the founder of the Scout and the Guides and all that sort of malarkey. You know, be prepared was the motto. Yoga says the best way to be prepared is to not be prepared. <laughs> is to be empty, not to come with anything, you know, as it were mentally. Yeah? To have the mind open, because reality is never going to be exactly as you think. It's going to be as it is. And to respond best to that, we come empty. Yeah? And that way we've got no agenda veiling our eyes yeah? and limiting our responses. It means we can be the most appropriate, the most loving possible. And of course, when we're relaxed as well, we have a sense of interdependence, which means equality. We, we see all things as equal. Your hunger is equal to my hunger. Huh? I want to solve it as much as I'd want to solve my own. Hmm? Now release your hands when you're ready and stretch the legs out <coughs> in front of you. Now we're going to sit in a wide dandasana, but not for long. Wide dandasana means what it sounds like, the legs are apart. And then you draw the buttock flesh uh, out and back. Some people will be best off sitting on a block. You'll know it because after drawing the buttock flesh out and back, and you can see that when I'm drawing the buttock flesh on one side, I'm leaning forwards and across to the other. So once you've done that, you'll know whether or not you need a block, you might already know anyway because you need to be able to be light. Remember, everything is everything. So lightness, if we want an attitude of lightness, like a dandelion seed, that's got, it's not got any weight, as it's not carrying anything, it's available. Because a dandelion seed is light, when currents move, it moves with every single, like completely perfectly responds to every current. Yeah? It's, it's like amazing. It's like the best surfer, but it's surfing air currents. A surfer themselves has to be light mentally. So for anything to be light, everything has to be light. And that means the body. So a light lower back, hands by your hips, sit up real tall. So that's why we might need a block. If you can't feel lightness in the lumbar, or if you're not sure, 
you sit on a block. Hands, as I say, by your hips. Arms stretch back and down. So the uh, chest muscles are stretched and the shoulder blades are drawn down. And there's a response to that drawing down at the back, which is a lifting up at the front. Any one of you who've you know, done the Vajrasati yoga teacher training will know that all instructions are married. <laughs> so if something goes down, it's gonna have a partner that's likely to go up. If something goes in, something else might go up. It's always got a partner, you know? So here the top of the thigh bones drop and then the spine lifts, drop. And then the spine lifts, drop. The word drop, <laughs> you know, that's something that's different from push it down, totally different, drop the thigh bones. It's much more meditative, it's much more generous. Generosity is part of our practice. Okay, well done. He's out of that. And we're going to come off our blocks. If you're on a block, come off the block. Take a breath or two. Give yourself a little energy bath before we proceed. So that means a rub down. And that means to distribute energy, prana, prana shakti everywhere. Prana shakti can be used as a synonym for kundalini. And kundalini can be used as a synonym for prana shakti. Both can be used as a synonym for the goddess, the word prakriti can be used as a synonym for the goddess. These are all uh, textually um, validated. <laughs> right? And flow is this, it's listening and responding, right? It's not that there's no action. I'm not completely passive, uh, but at the same time, the action is based on emptiness. Huh? So it's like, oh, it's magical, <laughs> actually. Now keep that in mind when you come into the next pose, because not everyone will be able to apply the word magical to Parapurna Navasana, but let's see what you can do. Lean your body back by 30 degrees, raise your legs up by 60. Mm -hmm. That means your toes are higher than your eyes. Okay, listen, it is okay for you to bend your legs as long as your thighs are going up at 60 if you need to. The arms come forwards like that. <clears throat> Parapurna, full. Um, Navasana, boat. The yogin will apply yoga to her every experience, including Parapuna Navasana. Right? So she's looking for flow. That can, as I mentioned, in include bending your legs. Huh? Because she's serving flow. She's not serving, not trying to prove anything to anyone or even to herself. She's like in an act of seva, it's called in Sanskrit, S E V A, seva. Service. Okay, probably in the bend your legs. Hug your legs, lift your chest, breathe through your nose. Loosen, 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 loosen the lumbar. Breathe, as I say, through the nose. Loosen, loosen, loosen the lumbar. <laughs> Jaw soft, eye soft, brain soft. So loosening the lumbar might involve um, moving left and right. And of course, we can talk about this in mundane physical terms. It, it all has mundane physical effects, hydrating and melting myofascia, for example, and the glide uh, that that conduces to. Okay, good. From here, we're going to lay down. I think that's quite usually quite popular. <laughs> so you can lay down, we're gonna lay down on our backs. If your head tips back, it can be useful to have a block uh, underneath your head so feel free and then just adjust for a moment so that means tucking the buttocks under where we're useful to lengthen the lower back muscles hands can be on the upper chest so the upper fibers of the pectoralis muscles and to make that more comfortable you can lift your elbow and that pulls the shoulder blade out and of course there's not a prescribed place, it's just you tune in through repetition, listening, responding. Draw soft, eyes soft. So feel free to move as many times as you like. Every time we move, we aspire to that refining our absorption in the goddess. As we're told, as I mentioned, we're told that the goddess <coughs> 
is there for the experience and enjoyment, but also the liberation of the purusha. Uh, the liberation of the purusha means that the purusha, the, the witness consciousness, no longer muddles itself with particularities. It no longer gets caught in this being more, more mine than that. So that has a double benefit of allowing nature to be her beautiful, ever-changing dance without encumbering her with me, myself, and I. And of course, she's not just out there in the bulbs and the new shoots. She's in your skin, in your bones, in the marrow, in your, even the thoughts we have of nature because they're interdependent. They belong to the goddess, which is a metaphor for that inter interdependence. Raise up <coughs> your legs. Let your lower back just kiss the floor. So get into that sort of uh, mood huh? where you could, you could feel that those words actually correlate to your experience that the lower back kisses the floor. like, you know, M-W-A-H, moi. And as the lower back kisses the floor, there's a release. The legs drift towards us. The abdominal muscles softly, intelligently, responsively get involved in the dance. And we can lift up our heads, bring our arms through the inside of the legs and hold the big toes, right? Then you bring your head back down. Don't forget you can have, as I mentioned before, support under your head and then a bit of rolling about right so this is a version of a pose that's become popular in the last i keep thinking it's recently i, I use the word recent for the last 15 years but that's i suppose that's not that recent so ananda balasana as it's called sometimes finds the uh, us holding the little toe side of the foot or the big toe side of the foot you can swap it up if you want. And ananda means bliss, actually. And bala means infant or child. So the inference here, the implication here, is that when the mind becomes metaphorically childlike because <laughs> you know children know what they are but there's a sort of sense of before your history there's a version of you that was before your history isn't there before some of the things you regret some of the things you know you love that have gone and some of the things that now describe the person that you describe as yourself there's a point before mm -hmm before and so that can be represented by the metaphor of, of a child huh? now that great before permanently exists it's before not just before your history but before anything you know the great before that's the mula prakriti huh? the relevance in this pose is to move in ways that surrender to this emptiness, which is the kind of metaphor for the mula prakriti, is empty because nothing, everything's still, everything's balanced. Huh? Before manifestation, we have mula prakriti. And when you uh, move backwards in the process known as involution, it's kind of the opposite to evolution, to that still point that lays at your heart all the time, then there's peace in every place. Peace in every place. So playing a, a little longer, you can play it up any way you like. As I mentioned, you can swap to the little toe side of the feet. You can take the legs wider. It's, um, it's actually my, my favorite uh, yoga stretch it is to take the legs really wide. And it just, I don't know what it does, but it, it's something magical for me, but it's not, not for everyone. Um, so you do whatever is for you, right? In terms of breath, could be bent legs, could be rolling, could
could be little toe side, could be big toe side, could be one leg straight, one leg bent. Either way, we then return, and if we weren't, we're going to now hold the little toe side of the feet and pull one leg down to the side of the ribs. The other one can be wherever it is. And of course, the body will drift as we do it on the other side. It will move towards the side you're pushing down. The pelvis doesn't have to be on the floor. But the yogini is advised to breathe into our practice. So we'll stay a couple more breaths. Hopefully there's a, still a bit of opportunity here for you to release, to breathe in, to release. Okay, much as this is uh, super beneficial, we'll release slow and gentle, nice and easy, <clears throat> to bring the feet back down to the floor. Scoot the buttocks under so you elongate your back that way and catch a couple of uh, deep breaths. Hold on. A couple of deep breaths. So deep breaths are everything. You can rest your hands where you like. Upper chest is a suggestion. Jaw, soft eyes, soft brain, soft. Deep breaths, soft neck. While taking deep breaths, raise a leg and dorsi and plantar flex the foot of that leg. Dorsi and plantar flex means pointing the toe for plantar, pushing the heel for dorsi. And of course, one feels muscles are moved when uh, one's doing that. Uh, and we know that hydrates the myofascia and melts extraneous fascia and brings increased blood supply and brings the lymph around the body. So we can list all these uh, uh, anatomical benefits. It, it knocks out nervous patterns, which might cause anatomical biases that can cause pressure on joints and so on. So, you know, it's not like our um, deeper layer yoga philosophy <coughs> doesn't also have a, a, a correlating um, mundane, you could call it, uh, ordinary, you could call it, uh, partner. Hmm? Heel in, toes out, bend at the knee, cross the leg over the other one, push beyond the outer ankle. Your foot is dorsiflexed. Lift the foot that's on the floor, off the floor. There's a gap, plunge through, interlace, and breathe easy. Your head can return down to the ground and you can roll around again, right? So rolling left, rolling right, looking for the indescribable richness that sucks you into Prakriti herself, the dance of interdependent nature of which there is nothing that is manifest that is not part of that. Whether it be thoughts, a person, a bird, you know, the movement of the ocean, whatever, you know, the stirring of bulbs under the ground. That jaw stays passive, those eyes stay soft. So obviously this is uh, hugely beneficial to spend a while, but I'll try to be on time. So we'll have to come out of that side and come to the other side. So take a breath between sides. Deep expressive breath or breaths, plural. And still breathing free. Don't, you don't have to move out of that lovely free breathing. Raise your other leg, dorsi plantar, dorsi plantar, dorsi plantar. Flex the foot and then turn when you're ready the heel in toes out cross that leg over the other go beyond the lateral malleolus the outer ankle keep the foot torsi flex lift the foot that's on the floor off the floor plunge through the gap interlace around your far shin or the back thigh return the head to the floor and roll about a bit right? look for those 
uh, juicy moments that are rich beyond description, unless that description was just a sort of flow of expressive language. Okay, yeah, we'll release nice and easy from that and roll over onto our sides where we come up from the side. We're gonna sit, if we're comfortable to sit in Siddhasana, that's recommended on a brick block is the recommended <coughs> um, prop to use. Siddhasana has various uh, forms, but heels align with each other in the midline of the body is uh, always part of it. Breathe through your nose, attention to the heart, jaw soft. Green Tara is made of green light. Green Tara is made of green light. And her Bija is Tong. Uh, T-A-M, but actually remember these are Sanskrit phonemes. So uh, the T is ta, it's, uh, just, it just sounds like ta. Uh, the A is a long A, ta, and the M is a nasal. And we're gonna make it pure nasal, like uh, so tong. Tong. Visualize that bija, that symbol in the heart center or visualize Tara, the green Tara, beautiful a woman, a, a youthful woman. Uh, Tara is represented like that usually. Uh, naked, but maybe wearing some uh, silks. With eyes full of love, huh? one leg up and one leg down both on lotus, she's sitting on a lotus on a moon mat on a lotus flower and her foot is coming down to another lotus because she's in meditation and in the world. She comes to the world from meditation, from emptiness. Hands to the heart, we'll chant just once that bija together to plant it in the heart for the day, the green Tara. Deep breath in, inhale. Ta Keep breathing deep and natural. Feel that the green Tara is now, as it were, placed, Nyasa, in the heart. And be aware of that as an orientation point throughout the day for all actions to come from the heart. Remember, the heart is the mula, is the mula prakriti, the beginning, the before. You can call it before, you can call it the beyond, you can call it beyond the mind. The yoga does all these things. We're going to release the hands. We're going to lay down in total surrender for two minutes. <laughs> two minutes of total surrender is a real gift. So we're going to lay ourselves on our backs for total surrender for two minutes. Ralph is out and about. He's having a stroll around now. Make sure you're warm. Supports under the knees are nice to take if you want. Great, palms face up, arms a good distance from the body. Shoulder blades scooted under and the chest buoyant. It has a sort of floating feel to it. And when we lay on our backs, this is all about giving. <laughs> and you only have to do it for a minute, but it's fun so fundamental that the third text ever written on Hatha Yoga 
the Dattatreya Yoga Shastra, this third text ever written only lists four practices, and this is one of them. It doesn't become known as corpse pose until the Hatha Pradipika, but this is one of them. So we'll follow the instructions from that text. Lay on your back with your mouth facing the sky as if you were dead, with limbs totally loose. Go ahead, follow these instructions. Lay on your back, mouth facing the sky, with limbs completely loose, as if you were dead. The text then says literally, look at the big toe, but unless you have an enormous big toe, you can't do that when you're laying on your back. So we have to presume it means perceive the big toe, feel it, feel the tinglings and sensations in the big toe. It says of your left or right foot, up to you. And because everything is everything, You can use anything, including the big toe as we're doing now, to follow like a trail of breadcrumbs back to its source. Its source is interdependence. It's the field, it's the goddess and she negates clinging. And when clinging is negated, tada drashtu swarupe avastanam, then then the seer rests in her own nature. You can, of course, lay longer if you have longer, but if it is time for you to come up, then make sure all your movements stay anchored in that tara that we're using as an anchor in the heart so you can wiggle your toes and fingers and stretch out arms and legs. Bend your legs, place your feet onto the floor. And then when you're ready, you'll roll to your left for a while. And then to your right uh, for a while. The timing's up to you. I'm just saying it for now or when you're ready. And then when you're ready, you'll come up from the side. <sighs> 